Uh, this is Seymour Rocks uh, reporting from Down Under. Um, so I'm just putting something together. Uh, I want to try and kind of explain how I feel about it, my, 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 my thoughts. Uh, I've been trying uh, in, my, um, in my reports to be objective as possible. Uh, I haven't tried to project an outcome, and you'll notice that I hardly mention the word blue sea event in my uh, reports. And of course, uh, I suppose sometimes a little bit of emotion seeps through, but mostly I've tried to keep it kind of uh, objective. So I just want to change that uh, because I think that yesterday's news or the news of the last couple of days was so momentous that I just have to kind of sort my head, my heart uh, out uh, and I'm going to try and do it um, and share it with you. So, but first of all, I just want to go through uh, a few things. This is more the media um, kind of response uh, uh, to this, to the extent that there has been any. So I'm just going to share a screen. Okay, so this is one of the pictures uh, from um, uh, for, you know, for, uh, for, from the Mosaic Expedition. So I, I just want to uh, wait a minute. So my head's not working very well this morning. So anyway, that shows kind of what I've been uh, talking about uh, for months and years. Uh, Margot and I have been talking about the, um, the uh, deteriorating quality of the ice, uh, but in the official kind of stuff from the experts is very little reflection of that. So let's just have a look at how the media has dealt with this. So um, this was interesting. I thought this, because uh, I, I looked up, I thought, oh, what does the Washington Post say about this? Because the Washington Post uh, often has some quite good articles. They're written by staff reporters and they're in depth. Um, but of this, uh, there was nothing except that they reprinted uh, this article from Associated Press. And the headline is, Scientists on Arctic Mission Make Unplanned Detour to Pole. So at least they, they, they show the photograph. But uh, anyway, here we are. A German icebreaker carrying scientists on a year-long international expedition in the high Arctic has reached the North Pole after making an unplanned detour there due to lighter than usual sea ice conditions. Um, so we made fast progress in a few days. It's breathtaking at times we had open water as far as the eye could see. Um, yeah, the region above uh, northern Greenland uh, sorry, I can't read that because it's behind something else. Uh, anyway, it's usually covered in thicker uh, sea ice, sometimes built over several years, that makes it difficult even for ships with hardened hulls to break through. But the Polish den was able to make it from the ice edge of the Fram Strait to the pole in less than a week. The mushy ice conditions the Polar Stern encountered uh, this year provide further evidence of the warming scientists say is taking place at the Arctic. And then they just go on uh, saying it involves scientists from 17 countries. It sailed from the Norwegian port of Tromsø last September, anchored to an ice flow, conducted uh, numerous uh, experiments, blah, blah, blah. The coronavirus almost caused the mission to be cut short as travel restrictions made resupply and crew rotations difficult, but they found a way around the logistical hurdles that involved just a brief break from the ice. After polling, passing the pole, the Polish den will anchor to a newly formed flow and observe the start of the freezing process that will see the Arctic covered 
once more in a mantle of sea ice. So you can see it's just a human interest story. They're implying that the whole thing is going to uh, freeze. They ignore the reality that this is part of a, um, of a continual decline in the quality of, of ice. And, um, uh, but this, this was more on because uh, this is from the Barents Observer and I would, I would expect this. Expedition shows scary photos from the North Pole, loose and weak ice with lots of melt ponds, partially open water and no signs of multi-year ice. The powerful photograph from Mosaic Expedition reaching the North Pole on August the 19th showed the dramatic impact of climate changes. So there we are, uh, a little bit of truth. It's probably about the only thing. Uh, but th it was this. I was really surprised to see this from Channel uh, nine in Australia, um, and they say climate change. Historic Arctic heat wave has thawed the North Pole so much it has shattered. So in other words, it's just we've had really hot weather and that has uh, melted the ice and, uh, um, you know, end of story. So it's just a one-off thing next year might be cooler, so we'll have more ice, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I just wanted to share this uh, lightning in North Greenland, south of Tula, uh, yesterday. Uh, now that is pretty amazing. I don't think that that has happened in the past. So anyway, so now I'm just going to uh, show you a report that shows the, uh, the uh, a, a scientific paper that shows the actual reality and of course, it's going to be ignored by everybody. Um, I've just had this come across my bow, um, this article. It's uh, the first bit of truth. This is what I've been saying for years. So um, anyway, let's just have a look. So this is from August 21, 20. Uh, ocean Arctic Ocean moorings shed light on winter sea ice loss. The eastern Arctic Ocean's winter ice grew less than half as much as normal during the past decade due to the increasing uh, influence of heat from the ocean's interior researchers have found. The finding came from an international study led by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Finnish Meteorological Institute. The study published by the uh, Journal of Climate used data collected by ocean moorings in the Eurasian basin of the Arctic Ocean from 2003 to 2018. Um, so the moorings measured the heat released from the ocean interior to the upper ocean and sea ice during winter. In 2016 to 2018, the estimated heat flux was about 10 watts per square meter, which is enough to prevent 80 to 90 centimeters, almost three feet of sea ice from forming each year. Previous heat flux uh, measurements were about half that much. So typically across much of the Arctic, a thick layer of cold fresher water known as halocene isolates the heat associated with the intruding Atlantic water from the sea surface and from the sea ice. This new study shows that the abnormal influx of salty warm water from the Atlantic Ocean uh, is weakening and thinning the halo scene, allowing more mixing. According to this uh, new study, uh, warm water of Atlantic Ocean is now moving much closer to the surface, etc., etc. Well, touche. That's what I've been saying all along. Um, a lot of what I've been saying over the years has uh, been railing um, against official denial 
uh, the inability of the media to speak the truth, the inability of some scientists to speak the truth. And this was true. I mean, if you go back over my blog, it's full of that. And of course, I went through a period um, of extreme anger over this and uh, partially influenced by my um, um, my involvement, what I would now probably describe as a cult. Um, but I just want to tell one story to uh, to illustrate it, this official um, kind of denial. Uh, a few years ago, I went to a meeting in our public library that was held by a retired uh, professor from Victoria University. It's probably just as well that I can't remember his name. Uh, anyway, he presented a film that he had made 10 years earlier and I found myself nodding my head with agreement. It was absolutely accurate and a very good film. Uh, and then when the film finished, he started speaking and everything he had to say um, was a denial of what he'd been saying 10 years earlier. He was giving all the reasons why there was lots and lots of hope. Um, things weren't as bad as kind of was thought and uh, you know, the media was responsible for feeding kind of negativity. Um, and then there was a lot of talk about planting trees and stuff like that. And then when I raised a question and I just kind of, I just made an observation of just kind of what I was, what, what I was seeing. I wasn't trying to lecture or anything. And he became very, very angry. Um, and you know, kind of did not, Denied, and that's when he, he he was saying his most kind of extreme uh, comments. And then a wee while later, I heard from some uh, some friends who had bumped into him, and uh, he admitted to them privately uh, that he didn't know how he would deal with a world without glaciers, because he's a glaciologist, by the way. Uh, so. He was saying one thing in private and exactly uh, the opposite um, in, in public. And that kind of, you know, I, I'm not sure what the motivation is, whether it's denial or just not wanting to kind of uh, scare the punters or, or what it is, and I, I just find that, uh, uh, I mean, even today, I'll just share this. Um, this is from Zach Labe, who is absolutely, I mean, you know, almost without peer in, in describing, you know, in, in, in researching this, but this thing, you know, even two days after these reports from the Polish dam that show that the, um, yeah, that the ice, you know, at the North Pole, at 90 degrees north, you know, all we've got is this, this, this thin kind of ice that's just not really hardly ice at all. And he's described, and then he's posting this, you know, going on just, you know, about the sea ice extent is, currently the second lowest on record. I mean, hell's bells. Why not give some, uh, you know, uh, some context to this, the situation, you know, uh, well, you know, it's really bad, but it's not as bad as we, you know, as it, as it could be, unless you take into account, of course, the, uh, <laughs> the ice at the North Pole. And then I saw, something else, I couldn't find it again, and it, it went around the different parts of the Arctic and to show that you know, there was uh, kind of almost record thickness of ice and, or something uh, you know, in, the, in the little inlets of the Canadian archipelago or something like that. So, I mean, that, I don't know what that was about. Was that trying to tell us that um, you know, it's really not so serious because there are these areas of 
of ice that are actually two meters thick, where a few years ago they might have been four meters thick. So that sort of thing. Anyway, so I regard that um, as a highly, yeah, a, as a form of denial. And of course, I've never liked it and I, I don't like it. Uh, but now I'm able just to mention it. I, I don't get sort of angry or obsessed by it. So anyway, there's that. This came across my bow um, yesterday, I think, or the day before. Um, on the very day, or the day after, the uh, photographs came out of the Arctic, which just show how incredibly bad things are. And he's, despite all of that, and knowing that, he posts this projecting sea ice extent from August 21st. Using losses from the previous 20 years, none produce a minimum below 2012. Uh, the average melt rate would place 2020 at the second lowest, while the slowest melt would result in fifth lowest. 19 of 20 produced the second lowest minimum on record. Oh God, spare me. You know, I mean, this is, so I went back, I said, do you ever people ever adapt your narrative to reality? Days after mosaic show thin slushy disappearing ice right at the North Pole. I suppose you can point to two meter thick ice north of the Canadian archipelago to say that this is the second worst year, which it clearly is not. And of course, as usual, they never ever address the points you're making. Uh, I, I said, uh, in my mind, after the reports from Mosaic, this verges on being disinformation. So he comes back. I've never denied what the photographs of the Polar Stern said. In fact, I've used it in recent tweets to highlight how vulnerable the ice around 80 degrees uh, north is, uh, is to the current weather conditions. If you read more than one or two of my tweets before your conspiratorial rants, you would know this too. Uh, well, I don't know kind of where the conspiracy comes in. I was just pointing out, um, you know, stuff that he he should know. So he doesn't he doesn't refer to the ice melting from beneath. It's all just the weather conditions, and he doesn't make any connection to the. Um, uh, to the sea ice thickness, or he doesn't even, or he doesn't connect that to the, um, uh, yeah, he doesn't connect it with sea ice thickness with sea ice extent. So, okay. And then he comes back uh, overnight. These particular posts are about the extent metric. I also have posts about volume satellite imagery of ice and other analysis. I agree we're in an unprecedented situation, but having consistent time series derived from observable and measurable metrics is still useful. Well, I call that bloody weasel words myself. And, it, and then it gets more and more uh, kind of emotive See, cherry picking bits of information is something you have no experience in. Then concocting grand conspiracies is anti-science. If, like I said, you looked at more than one tweet uh, for, for context, then you'd realize how foolish you're being. Well, I have looked at his, his other tweets and I'm not being foolish and I'm not laying out a grand conspiracy either. And I'm not anti-science only I'm only anti-science when the scientific data is used to uh, to posit something that's been proven right at every uh, every point you know the the modelers were saying you know that things were going to get bad in 2020 2100 uh, you know their models told them that and now they've had to reality is uh, force them to to redo the data, and now they've come up with 2050. And of course, um, you know, despite the the Arctic melting in front of our very eyes, um, then uh, they say they still say, "Oh, it's going to melt in 2040." So, yeah.
I have a strange relationship with climate change deniers. In a strange way, I don't mind them too much, so long as they don't mind me. And it perplexes me how they can see something so clearly, but be so obstinate over climate change. I guess it comes down to what you want to believe. Um, and with them, often it comes down to what they identify as, uh, well, complete corruption, the new world order in governments and international organisations like the IPCC. And it just about always comes down to Agenda 21 or Agenda 2030. Often what they come up with is true in part, except they all, to a man, cannot distinguish between the corruption of elites from what is actually happening in nature. Now that we have crossed various trigger points and unleashed a huge number of positive feedbacks, I think the debate about CO2 and greenhouse gases and their contribution to warming has become almost irrelevant. CO2 is now entering the atmosphere at a huge rate and that's coming from natural sources like massive wildfires more than a, uh, it's coming from man-made industrial sources. Gaia has a mind of her own. At this juncture it does not matter to me whether warming is coming from, uh, from CO2, whether it's coming from underneath the Earth, or even from terraforming of the Earth by aliens. In some ways, it does not matter what people believe anymore. Although I believe solidly that climate change is largely due to the greenhouse uh, effect and CO2 and other emissions. We are living well and truly in the era of consequences, whatever we do. The deniers do have a point. My partner looked at Agenda 2030 the other day and she is an ex-civil servant and quite familiar with the language. Looking at it, it is full of aspirational goals that seem quite positive until you look behind the weasel words and realise that we're moving further and further from fulfilling the lofty goals that they put forward uh, and until you realise that the only main area where they're advancing right now is in their plans to vaccinate the entire population of the planet and that's set out in considerable detail by the World Health Organization as part of Agenda 2030. So on balance, I don't really mind the deniers to some extent, and I certainly don't want to uh, uh, criminalize them or cancel them like the liberals want to do, who just want to wipe out anything that opposes their, their, uh, their viewpoint from the record. So what I want to say to these people is I don't care what you think or what your opinion is and Mother Nature certainly doesn't care. Mother Nature is indifferent to what humans think. The polar ice is not going to stop thawing simply because you think it is not. Yeah, uh, I find myself kind of uh, in a very tiny minority within another tiny minority and that of course uh, the tiny minority that I'm talking about is the near-term human extinction uh, kind of movement um, and kind of yeah, Guy McPherson is the one that's been responsible for that. I've always accepted his ideas, uh, but based on the evidence that he provides, um, but I've never been, you know, kind of fully on board. 
I've, I've defended him many, many times, uh, you know, when he was attacked by, by sort of official uh, deniers, and I would stand by that uh, to this uh, very day. But I've, something that I've been able to un understand less and less over the last couple of years is this obsession, well, yeah, with, yeah, obsession with, with the Blue Sea event. And of course it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's coming, but you know, the question was always um, kind of, you know, when, is it going to be this year? Is it going to be next year? And I've learned a few things in the last couple of years uh, in 2018, I got to know Margot, and somehow we managed to start sharing things. And she um, shared me, with me a lot of the stuff that she was doing to uh, monitor the sea ice, um, which she shared with me, and which she'd worked out on herself. Nobody had told her, and of course it's highly accurate and what we realize is that it's not the blue sea event but it's what's happening uh now you know the the constant whittling away of the ice from from beneath through the um you know the you know the uh the warm currents from the atlantic and everything and and we were just showing this you know it was really bad in 2018 and it was a bit worse in 2019 uh and of course this year well we've just seen what we have so i think 2018 was the last year in which um a guy might have made a a prognosis he, he said you know oh there's going to be a blue sea event and from what i remember and this really upset me greatly um was at the end of it of course as with last year at the very last minute um you know we were we were safe for another year um because the blue sea did, event didn't happen um and then I remember some people threw a multi-year party to celebrate this non-event, um, and it was just—it was just crazy. There was nothing to celebrate. Um, yeah, the, the 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 constant sort of decline, um, you know, of of the sea ice, as if. As if there's a singular event, everything's all right until until the blue sea event happens. And I've never uh, really, uh, you know, quite understood that. And even now, you know, I see someone on Twitter who um, is, you know, saying, "Oh, it's a bad, a bad melt day." Uh, you know, there's a twenty percent chance of a blue ocean event, or uh, yesterday there was a 23% chance, and today it's a 30% chance. Uh, that seems just totally meaningless. I mean, for a start, I just don't really get where he gets his his figures from, and that all seems to be based around analysing uh, sea ice extent and and ignoring the the other important aspects. I mean, otherwise, how could you? Uh, how could you calculate that that's the case? Uh, so, yeah, I don't think there's going to be a, a sea ice, a blue sea event in the in, in, in the um, in the classic meaning of the word. There's there's still a reasonable uh, area of ice, um, kind of in you know in the inlets of the Canadian archipelago and then north of of that there's ice that's two meters thick whereas in previous years it was perhaps four meters thick you know old ice um so yeah i just don't really understand this and it seems to me like with all denial there's a lot of 
deflection. There's a lot of um, uh, you know trying to justify things, and uh, you know it's either it's either or. But of course, in reality, it's neither either or. Um, it'll be very interesting now that we know that the the ice has practically melted at the North Pole, and for most of the region between the you know Greenland and the North Pole, um, you know what's going to happen in the next few months? How is that going to affect the remelt? Uh, sorry, the refreezing. Um, you know, because there'll be larger areas of of of, of dark sea. You know, uh, there'll be less, st even more. You know, less uh, albedo, and um, you know, what's that going to do with the methane and everything? So, you know, we don't need the singular event to to trigger these things. It's it, 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 it's an ongoing uh, process, and we're we're not at the end. And even if we see a blue sea event, that's not the end either. Uh, so that yeah. Uh, I might not be expressing this very clearly, but that's kind of how I uh, I feel about things. So, how do I feel about all of this? There's hardly a day that goes by that I do not grieve for the world around me for the living planet and for all the wondrous creatures that inhabit it, as well as for the people. And right now, as I speak this, I feel a constant anxiety that manifests as a feeling of heaviness in the chest. I didn't feel it for a lot of the day, but when I started listening to a video about all of this, it just immediately came back. So how can one not feel this if one stops for a single moment to reflect on the dying polar bears, infect on indigenous people in the Arctic, and what comes next, the crop failures that will come even without the vaunted Blue Sea event? We're just living in the age of consequences, and you can see it in the pictures from the North Pole. It's not as if that is the only predicament that the human race is facing. From war, to economic collapse, to a worldwide pandemic that seems to me to have been predicted and engineered to create a move from a relatively open society to an authoritarian society where the populations are hungry and have no human rights anymore and are basically completely under the control of a global elite that nobody ever voted for. So right now I can't see any grounds for real hope that we're ever going to come out the other side of this and maintain any sort of civilization, even if we survive this at all. So the question of um, are we facing near-term human extinction or are we not is also, well it's moot. It's, uh, and in fact when I stop to think about this, I think there's a fate that's worse than death. And that's that humans continue to exist in some form of half-human, half-artificial intelligence, essentially as hungry ghosts that live some form of half-life. Now that is my true nightmare. I'd rather die than be a slave. Um, and so I feel this very, very, very deeply and increasingly as time goes on and especially in the last couple of days. So there are various aspects to this 
that determine how I deal with this. Uh, firstly, there's my own health, which has been on a slide for 10 years now, uh, without any diagnosis or health intervention that has ever helped me. And it appears to have a large neurological component. Every day I wake up from a night of assisted sleep and have to deal with dizziness and I get around uh, these days with the help of a walking stick. I keep working uh, despite the odds and at best these days I have a few hours when I have the clarity of mind and the energy to continue my work. That usually turns to custard by uh, mid-afternoon. I've had plenty of opportunity to contemplate my own demise and come to accept it. In addition, for 30 years I've had a spiritual practice that was largely based on Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta and I'm a great fan of Krishnamurti. I've never really believed in God and the sense of an old man with a beard in the sky. However, I have imbibed the idea that I'm not this body or even my mind, but rather all that there is and ever has been is consciousness or whatever label you like to give it, totality or God or Jehovah. In the words of David Icke, uh, he expresses it quite well, I am consciousness having this experience as Robin and when I leave this body I will return to undifferentiated consciousness. So for me there's no real uh, reason for for fear, fear of death and I think that fear of death is behind all the reactions of anger and denial and, uh, uh, and, and and whatever. I don't really, well I like to think anyway, that I don't have anything more than an animal fear of death which is common to all sentient beings. It does not educate the way in which I see the world as it does for most people who to react to this whole predicament uh, from a fear of a fear of death. Uh, but on the other hand I'll come clean and admit that apart from my beloved partner uh, I have no one else other than friends. I have no living parents. I don't have children. I don't have grandchildren. So there's no one really for me to kind of worry about. So I guess that's part of the picture as well. But I am empathic and I feel everything deeply and I feel the fate of others. But what is largely missing in this equation is, is, is fear. So I endeavour to stay with the what is and the present moment and do not dwell uh, too much on what may come next, although I do study it, so intellectually. And obviously, uh, as I've pointed out, I feel it viscerally. So I try generally to keep the I out of what I do. So I'm not trying in what I do, keeping a blog going for year after year to attract either fame or notoriety but I've always I've always expressed my role as being akin to a postman so I see some information I send it there I see some information there and I send it over there um, and yeah so I'm not looking for likes or dislikes even though it does aggrieve me uh, when I observe of course that people are not seeing uh, clearly, but are falling into kind of instinctual behaviour you know, of um, you know, anger and denial um, and 
you know, arguing or trying to deflect or anything like that. I think it behoves us to stop all of that in its tracks and just to look at the facts as they are or as we see them and also just to be with our own uh, response, visceral or emotional, uh, just to kind of see it as that's what the body does. So that in brief is kind of to give you an idea of my own kind of um, subjective experience of all of this. Um, so yeah.